think it's important to say that, you know, anyone who has experienced or been in the United States for any period of time and experienced this country's history and knows it cannot have believed that it would be easy to elect a woman president, let alone a woman of color. Mm -hmm. Let's just be clear. Mm -hmm. And nothing that was true yesterday about how flawlessly this campaign was run is not true now. Mm -hmm. I mean, this really was an historic flawlessly run campaign. She had, Queen Latifah never endorses anyone. She came out and endorsed, you know, I mean, we, she had every prominent celebrity voice. She had the, she had the, uh, the Taylor Swift, she had the Swifties, she had the Beehive. Like you could not have run a better campaign in that short period of time. And I think that's still true. Mm -hmm. They aren't going to learn anything, are they? Hey guys, I'm Hannah Cox with Base Politics. Welcome to my channel where I bring you my politically homeless takes on politics and culture. Before we dive in today, make sure you like this video, subscribe to my channel if you have not already, and of course, ring that notification bell so you never miss one of my episodes. So my whole household is getting struck and I think I am the last one standing. So that's why my eyes are a little watery today. And I'm gonna try to get through this recording and edit everything and get it out before I get fully sick. So we're gonna speed through some of this today. That opening clip you saw was the endlessly inane Joy Reid on CNN offering her take on the election results. And while I actually covered that clip on my TikTok and Instagram earlier this week, I wanted to circle back to it because it is so indicative of the problems that the left has right now. I don't think I have to explain to anybody, even somebody on the pretty far left, why her statements are so ridiculous. Like, I don't know how they expect absolutely anybody to buy that they are the party that represents the working class. And their proof of that is that they got all of these millionaire and billionaire celebrities to endorse them. Newsflash. Nobody cares. Nobody cares at all, first and foremost. Only like 12-year-old girls hyped up on hormones give a crap what any celebrity has to say, period. But particularly right-wing people do not care what celebrities have to say. They're seen as far left, detached, and honestly, often very kooky. Not to mention corrupt, given many of the stories we have learned around Jeffrey Epstein and P. Diddy as of late. And not only do people not care about celebrity endorsements, but I can't emphasize enough that they particularly do not care about Queen Latifah's endorsement, who I'm pretty sure has not been relevant since the early 2000s, if she even was then. Like, what are you on, Joy? To say that Kamala ran a flawless campaign, you just, you have to be high. She did not. She ran a very failed campaign. She failed to speak to the dominant issues that Americans were saying concerned them the most over and over and over again, namely the economy and immigration. She did not connect with the voters. She didn't even connect with her own base. I don't know how anybody could look at this whole hot mess and think, hmm, we have nothing to learn here. It's just that all of these Americans, all 70 plus million of them are racist and bigots and idiots. Come on. But this is a sentiment that is actually being spread all over social media. Here's just one example of a Democrat saying anyone blaming Harris or Waltz today has utterly lost the plot and missed the point. No, they haven't. When a candidate loses, the point is to observe what they did wrong, to analyze it, and then to try to do better the next go around. He goes on to say, this is fundamentally about America, toxic masculinity and white supremacy. Blaming Harris would be part of that problem, not the solution. She deserves our thanks. Thank you, VP Kamala Harris. I mean, I guess keep digging your heels in and calling everybody toxic and telling them that they're white supremacists and they're Nazis. I'm sure that will work out for you next cycle. Kamala didn't lose because she was black or because she was a woman. In fact, I think those are the only reasons that she became VP in the first place. She was not qualified for this position. She couldn't even sit down to talk policy for just a few hours without weeks and weeks of prep, which is why she and her team dodged Joe Rogan, basically saying that they were going to have to bring his production to them in order for her to do it and trying to limit it to, I think it was an hour or something. And then she turned around and went on SNL where she was given a script. Kamala lost because Kamala was a bad candidate and because Democrats are offering bad policies and bad solutions to the issues people care about, period. End of story. This isn't about sexism. This isn't about racism. There are a ton of women in office already for the record. 
In fact, at the start of 2024, there was a record-breaking number of women serving in the U.S. Congress. In the House, you have 128 women who hold seats, comprising about 29% of the chamber's membership. The Senate includes 25 women, making up a quarter of its members. In total, women account for 153 of the 535 seats in Congress, representing 28.6% overall. Not only that, but women are better represented in state legislatures than ever before, with 32.7% of seats being held by women, totaling 2,416 of the 7,386 state legislative positions across the U.S. And we also have 12 female governors in the country as of right now. So is it like an even split? No, but plenty of women get elected to office and probably plenty more will over time. But if you can believe it, Joy Reid was not the only talking head offering abysmally stupid takes on this loss. Watch. Particularly the media ecosystem, they've, it's not a good one. It's a negative one. It's a, it's a radicalization funnel. But what they have done in their online media ecosystem uh -huh. is build a radicalization engine, literally the way militant groups do around the world, that takes people from relatively low-level annoyances with the world. Why are eggs so expensive? Why is my kid learning this new thing in American history in school that I didn't learn? And then moves them through YouTube videos, through podcasts, moves them from that annoyance all the way, slowly, 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 to a full-blown fascist politics. It's an elaborate, multi-billion dollar infrastructure, and there is nothing like it on the pro-democracy side. We, we don't have an... Inf when, when, a, when a man is just lost and lonely and not yet radicalized, we don't have the equivalent of Joe Rogan and right. Jordan Peterson to move that man in a feminist direction. By the way, we should educate men that it's actually really great to live with a strong woman who makes money. It's actually easier. Life is easier. But I think me it is hilarious to me that he doesn't think Democrats are doing this and have done this for decades and decades and decades. The only difference is they have had the mainstream media and all of its billions of dollars and all of its millions and millions of impressions at their disposal. And now they have competition via online media and independent media. And like proof is in the pudding, right? The people on the left have been just as stirred up, just as emotionally manipulated as anybody has been on the right. How else do you explain this, dude? Like you are also radicalizing people. You just used to be the only ones doing it. And again, you don't like the fact that now there is this whole other ecosystem that can speak to people and compete with your craziness. And really what this should spur is some analysis on why that ecosystem started in the first place. Hint, it was in reaction to the insane left-wing dominated mainstream media. People were sick of it. They were sick of being lied to. They were sick of the partisanship. They were sick of the hyperbole. And so these other kinds of sources of information began to pop up, which is great. That's what you would hope to see in a capitalist system. This is one reason I am so rapidly pro tech freedom, even when the Republicans aren't consistent on that. This is what you would expect to see happen. And it's been very successful because the market wanted it. They were sick of the left wing echo chambers. Now, while a lot of people in left-wing traditional mainstream media have been giving the most ridiculous analysis of the election and its result, it seems Van Jones has been on a common sense campaign saying something different this week. And here's how we got beat. We got beat because the Republicans and the conservatives built a different media system that had to do with online, had to do with podcasts, had to do with, with streaming platforms, and they were spending their money there. We were laughing at them and knocking on doors in Philadelphia and Detroit. It was like, there's no Trump people. They're not dropping literature. They're not dropping, dropping on, knocking on doors. Ha, well, in ha, fact, ha. It, was, it was laughing like, oh, Elon Musk and Charlie Kirk, yeah. but their PACs don't we know were, what they're doing. We, they're were, making, we the were making fun of Donald Trump for having thrown away his ground game and doing some weird stuff online. We thought that they were, were idiots. It turned out we were the idiots. We woke up in a body bag because while we were knocking mm -hmm. on doors, they were making these phones into... 24 hour a day political weapons for themselves. And so we got outflanked, outplayed, outbeat by people who told us the whole time that they knew what they were doing. Not only did they know what they were doing, they were able to use their resources more effectively. I mean, Kamala outraised Trump at a crazy pace, and yet it did not get her over the finish line. And I'm pretty sure I saw reports today that 
the campaign is now in debt. So I don't know where that money went or how they were spending it besides ads. I'm going to guess on some pretty expensive celebrity endorsements that didn't do anything for them. But the Trump campaign managed to use its resources more efficiently and were able to still reach a lot of people in a more effective manner, that being online versus going door to door. And this is why I have been harping and harping and harping on the need for the same kind of media infrastructure when it comes to libertarian ideas and people in the middle, because I think there is equally a market drive for that. I think people are hungry for it. I think that there is a need for it in order to push back on the extremes of the left and right. But right now, the funders within this movement have not been as focused on that as they should be. And perhaps this should be even more of a wake up call on that front. But just to be clear, Kamala losing is not just about who had the media or who had a bigger microphone. It ultimately was about what they were saying with that microphone. And I think Van Jones, again, did a good job calling that out. If progressives have a politics that says all white people are racist, all men are toxic, and all billionaires are evil, it's kind of hard to keep them on your side. And so we might want to think about if you're chasing people out of the party, you can't be mad when they leave. And maybe if we had a different politics, we actually said dignity for everybody, everybody's respected and we need you, more people might stay. My only point is this, um, you know, it's sad that we've lost Elon Musk. And, and I, and I want to point out, <clears throat> four years ago, Elon Musk was an Andrew Yang Democrat. Yeah. Don't forget that. Oh, yeah, I know. I mean, I mean he's, he's done great stuff when it comes to climate, when it comes to space, et cetera. And he, so is Trump, a Democrat. <laughs> well, he oh, was. Yeah, he was. He was. So, yeah. um, but I, I just wonder if we look back on this period, there's no excuse for stuff that Elon Musk is doing, the stuff he says is you know, irresponsible. But if progressives have a politics that says all white people are racist, all men are toxic, and all billionaires are evil, it's kind of hard to keep them on your side. And so we might want to think about if you're chasing people out of the party, you can't be mad when they leave. And maybe if we had a different politics, we actually said dignity for everybody, everybody's respected and we need you, more people might stay. Yeah. He is so spot on with this. I have seen so many people on the left saying like, we have to build our own online media infrastructure. We need our own Elon Musk and Joe Rogans. And it's like, you had your Elon Musk and your Joe Rogans. You called them racist. You tried to cancel them. You literally condemned people who went on their platforms. Like you drove these people away. These were people that used to be on the left and you acted so ridiculous ridiculously that you've lost them. Secondarily, the left already does have a media infrastructure. Again, it's the mainstream media. And to pretend as if they just have no online media game, no like influencer game is totally wrong. Like the Kamala campaign spent a good bit of money on those things as well. I just think ultimately they weren't successful because they didn't have the right messages. It's not just that you were only speaking to some people or about some people and canceling too many of the others. It's that your policies do not work for the vast majority of people, even those you claim to be working to identify with and uplift. But believe it or not, all these folks are still getting closer to having it right when it comes to what Democrats need to do next and the lessons they need to learn than the witches over on The View. Think critically. If we could regulate social media, because one of the biggest defenders is D.C. and Congress have not been able to do one thing uh -huh. in regard to the okay. rogue corporations and social get media. Better with, with, with Elon it Musk now in, the, in the administration. I want, I want well, you see what would really be a good idea, what would really help is if we could just shut our competition up. Like, lady, pipe down, shut up. I would love to also shut down the view and not have to hear your dumb blabber every day on social media, but that is your First Amendment right, and so therefore I will continue to stand up for it even though I think you offer literally nothing to the discourse. But really the most depressing thing about this is that Democrats and Republicans have already been hard at work trying to do exactly what she is suggesting for the past couple of years, and unfortunately, the NatCons are mostly in support of them, including J.D. Vance, who has been a ringleader on this front. They have been working hard to seize control of the tech industry, to silence dissent, 
to take over content moderation decisions to limit the success of independent journalists and independent media online at the direct behest of traditional media through things like the Journalism Competition and Protection Act. They've been going after Section 230, which is a very good law that shields free speech online and that if you got rid of would instantly lead to far less discourse being allowed to take place on any of these platforms, including this one we're on right now. What she suggested is disgusting. It's undemocratic. It's an attack on the Constitution. It is an explicit attack on free speech and the First Amendment. And it's the philosophy of losers who can't compete in the marketplace of ideas. And again, this is something you're going to see more and more of. This guy said, Trump's campaign strategy was to target young men who mostly interacted with politics through edgy bro podcasts and social media. In July, campaign manager Susie Wiles tasked a 27-year-old with spearheading Trump's podcast circuit. And clearly, that was a pretty successful strategy. My friend Stephen Kent, who also works in the tech space, said, prepare for a flood of think pieces over the next four years about the urgency of content moderation for podcasts. And yeah, I think you probably will see that and you need to be on guard against it. And you need to be on guard against it, not only because free speech is sacred and without it, we cannot have a free society, period, end of story, but also because your ability to actually access good, honest, real-time information would be severely limited. We know that traditional media is not doing a good job at actually delivering the facts to people that they need in order to fully participate in their system. The drive to come after online media and independent media and censor it is multiple fold. I mean, obviously they want to undercut their competition for monetary issues. The government wants to get control of the narrative back because they used to just have a small number of publications over here that they could kind of puppeteer and make sure that the narrative stayed, uh, you know, kind of along the lines of what they wanted it to be. And the Democrat journalists largely fell in line because they are not people who work against the system. They are there to uphold the establishment. That is what they have become. And so without online media, without podcasts, I don't think you're going to get very good information. You're not going to get information that is vital to your participation in the system. And honestly, you're clearly not even going to get very much reflection when there is a substantial voter turnout on something that really helps people understand what Americans are saying, what they want, what outcomes they need, and how politicians can better serve those needs. Ironically enough, it's the grassroots that I'm observing on TikTok and other platforms discussing these election results that are actually getting it right in contrast to the vast majority of these talking heads that work for establishment large media outlets. Watch. It's crazy that I was today years old. Um, being almost 30 years old and having this realization today. Like, I just always thought when I would talk to people, I'd be like, yeah, I grew up in a, I feel like I grew up in a town and ended up moving to a town that I didn't belong in a way. Um, obviously having more like liberal thoughts. And I just thought like, yeah, like this is what the rest of the world is like though. Like I'm living in a bubble now that I just have different, I had great friends and uh, nothing against those people, but I was just always like, okay, I feel a little bit removed because I think I just have very different thoughts. And I think they could tell you that too, um, about life. But in my mind, I was just like, it's okay because like, I'm not going to be here forever. I'm going to go back to being in a city and being with how the rest of the world thinks in a fresh, new, exciting way about life. And I just realized today I was so wrong. I was so opposite. I live in a bubble. We live in a bubble being in New York City and these bigger cities and like thinking that like all this change is happening and all this excitement because a lot of us are really have like a similar mindset. And then I realized like, oh my God, I said my whole life that I grew up being in a town that I felt was like a little bit closed minded and, and a little bit behind on things. And I, I felt like, I was like, I'm in a bubble, but like, I'm so happy that I'm able to get out of that bubble. No, I'm in the bubble. I'm in the bubble, the rest of the United States and the world think so differently. And my mind was, compl I was wrong. How crazy is that? I know I'm in grief and the stage of grief I'm in right now is like, take it. Peace, bitch. I don't care no more. I'm done. Like, y'all, this is what you wanted? Okay, cool, cool, for sure, for sure, for sure. I feel like in 2016 and 2020, there was this idea of like, well, we won the popular vote. 
So like, we know what the majority of the country, he got the poppy vote. By a hefty amount, take it, take it. Y'all are curious what a House, Senate, and Oval Office looks like for you? Take it, okay, I'm good. And like, I saw that video of the guy being like, Democrats need to realize that we can be really fucking annoying. And I was like, that's tape, that is tape. Like we are the party of being like, you mispronounced one thing, you're a bigot. And it's like, where's the grace for humanity? I know non-binary people in real life who have mixed up another non-binary person's pronouns and they've been like, oh, bet, sorry, and keep going. Online, we are like you to the stocks, death to all of them. Mr. Speed, whatever Wendy Williams says, right? Like we are unforgiving of just humanity sometimes. And sometimes that is intentional bigotry that we're commenting on, but other times it's a fucking gotcha. And I think that like, I talk about this with my friends sometimes. I'm like, in big cities where Democrats are, we can get very regional with our beliefs and like have these conversations around like communism and socialism and like Marxism. And it's like, this is like an LA conversation, girl. In the middle of Louisiana, they're not fucking talking about that. They're like, why is the gas so high? Obviously there's reasons why that is attributed to like politics and why that's happening, why the Democrats have like received the brunt of like the prices are so much higher, like whatever. But it's like, I think it's cool to be a Republican right now in a crazy way. The branding is like much more inclusive. It is a wide net. Any and all are welcome to be a Trump supporter. And like, it, it is less judgmental amongst them, right? Like we are not <laughs> the most welcoming people. And I think sometimes I have to catch myself presuming what people in small towns want and need. I don't know, girl. I like collect mugs from small towns because I'm like, that's so cute that I'm here. Oh my God, there's a tractor. Oh, they have those here. Like, oh my God, I love that. That is really patronizing. <laughs> I don't like actually have intel on what's happening in these small towns and then I try to be like, well, this is what you need. I don't know what the fuck you need. And this election has taught me that that maybe for the midterms in 26 and the election in 2028, we as a party need to like go to these places and really like be a part of these communities before we try to like tell them what they need. I don't know. And they think Trump does. And maybe I have to humble myself to be like, maybe he does. Maybe there's something I'm missing because I don't know what you need. Y'all have an idea for yourselves. You are fully autonomous human beings. You can make a decision to vote for whatever fucking criminal you want to vote for, that's on you, do you. At this point, I have to stop assuming that I know what's best for you because I don't even know you. How could I know what's best for you? I'm checking out. I love that last guy's rant, not only because I appreciate somebody who has intellectual humility, but because he that that rabbit hole for him is leading him to a place of concrete truth, right? When he says, maybe I don't know what's best for these people in places that I am unfamiliar with and that are outside my realm of understanding. Like, yes, you're hitting on a big truth and, and the one that actually informs my views and that of everybody else in my camp, which is that limited government is good because we do not know what is best for people, right? There's a million arguments against it and there's a million bad things that happen when you have big government, but most of it comes down to that premise. It is extremely arrogant to think that you are some kind of God or higher being that's no, that knows what's better for other people. This is the entire premise of America and the American dream and the constitution is that we don't. We don't know what's best for people. We don't know how to micromanage an economy. We don't have all the facts at our disposal that one would need in order to make these large overarching decisions for people's life. And thus the best thing we can do is to guard natural inherent rights and then turn people loose, turn the spirit of humanity loose, unleash capitalism, and let people figure that out for themselves without the government getting in their way. And that is a premise that has been successful, that has led to an increase in the quality of life, that has led to an increase in wealth every single time it has been allowed to flourish. 
But unfortunately, in this country, increasingly over the past 100 years, and you can really see this if you dig into my original base series where I dig into like the root causes of big, big problems that face us today and like healthcare, immigration, and start tracing back the policy decisions and the legal decisions that got us where we are. You can see this encroachment over the past 100 years of government getting bigger and bigger and bigger and usurping our fundamental rights and usurping the Constitution. And during that time period, everything has gone downhill. We have been being pulled off a cliff by progressives who are actually socialists who want centralized control because they are arrogant. They do have the audacity to think that they can centrally plan an economy and moreover, that they can centrally plan your life, so that they know what's best for you, that they can be your mother and father, and that you need to just hand over control to them and let them micromanage your life. And it is that that people largely rebuked in this election. Central planning does not work, period. And I love that when people really start to examine what happened around this election, that is the ultimate thought that they are going to stumble upon in the process. You try to tell people what they should care about, what should matter to them, what they should think. And finally, enough people had enough and said, no, you're not going to dictate these things for me. I know what's best for my own life. And I want some relief from this nanny state, from this patronizing viewpoint and from this oppressive system. I'm not sure if the left-wing bubble is bursting all the way right now, but I think it's closer than I have ever seen it, at least in the past 20 years. And personally, I find this to be an exciting time. This is a really good time for outreach. It's a time to be actually working, to be in conversation with people on the left, to help them understand the mechanisms at play here, and to give them better and more tangible things they can work on in order to achieve a better world instead of just running around and calling everybody racist and buying into the left-wing media's hysteria that's telling them all of their rights are going to be taken away and that the world is going to crumble on their heads. All right, guys, I hope you like this episode. I'm going to go take some NyQuil. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel if you have not already, and if you want even more content, you can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, or TikTok.